I'm, I'm very happy to be here in honor of <laughs> Ellen Potter, who's a, been a very good friend. And we've, we've often, you know, as part of our mission in science is to outreach to students. It's very challenging when you're sort of trapped in the laboratory or traveling around the world 100,000 miles or more a year to do this. And so we can, we can have folks in our laboratory interact with the education group with, with Donna and Ellen and now the new folks to, to translate what we do to the, to, the, to the students. So we have High School Science Day, for example, and a lot of the folks in our lab are engaged in that. Um, and, and I occasionally appear every now, <laughs> every now and then. So what I want to do is tell you a bit about this, this plant, Arapidopsis, which is here. So why, why in the world would we study this weed, right? So this is a question you know, you, your parents would ask you. Why are you studying you plant weed? biology? Why are you studying this weed? Okay, so I'm going to try and, and go this. So what is Arapidopsis? Okay, so Arapidopsis is a member of the family of Brassicaceae, where these are the kind of things that your kids don't want to eat, broccoli, cauliflower, et cetera. So this is sort of the, the family that it's in, but it really serves as a reference organism for, for many plant species. And so it's not unique in the role of the so-called model organism. It, this, this just shows a number of model organisms that have been studied by scientists over the decades, beginning with E. coli, other bacteria, the fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster, C. elegans worm. So these were the two model organisms that were sequenced alongside of Arapidopsis. So basically, there was a race on. The genomes are about the same size. That's what's shown here on the bottom. How many millions of A, T, Cs, and Gs are in the genome? Arapidopsis is a little bit bigger than these guys. And so we sort of finished this race we didn't want to be behind these folks. And then some of the other model organisms, uh, mouse and, and, of course, human, and Dictystelium, et cetera, over here, Saccharomyces, the, the baker's yeast, or down here, much smaller genomes. But these are all used to understand principles related to either animal development, so for like C. elegans or Drosophila, mouse, or plant development in the case of Arapidopsis. So they call it a model organism, right? And so one of the students made this sort of model here. There's the Arapidopsis parts, and you have to put them together. But I actually like to call this a reference plant. Essentially, it's not a model for a plant, it is a plant, okay? And it's not, it essentially is the, all of the genes required to build a plant are in there, okay? So this is sort of the joke of the, of the lab. So really, it's a, a reference species for about 250,000 plant species. And the information that we're building, a set of the sort of set of reference books here, if you will, encyclopedias, that's the old way of thinking. I guess now it's Wikipedia for Arapinopsis, is to try and understand essentially everything about it that we can. How all of the genes work, how all of the cells work, how they communicate with one another, how the plant grows and flowers and produces seeds, et cetera. And that that information essentially can be applied to every other plant, basically. And so this is a Arapidopsis in the wild, if you will, sort of in the, in the dish here, as we're basically in a, in a, in a, in a growing it in a, in a, in a, what's called a plant container here on agaros or in dirt in the, in the uh, soil in, the, in, the, in our greenhouses. And so why pick this plant? So actually, it's been worked on for over, over 100 years in terms of people identifying that there's something interesting about this plant. Uh, uh, and why did molecular biologists like myself want to work on this plant? And as Ellen said, it's mainly because of the genetic properties. It has a small genome. It has you know, a genome that's 1 25th the size of your genome. Okay, so one, 1 25th the size, so a three, human genome has 3 billion base pairs, a rabbit has 125 million base pairs. So a little bit easier to work on that if you're going to try and study the genes. There's a lot less DNA in the cells. Um, it grows relatively quickly. So you can plant the seed and then grow the plant and collect seed from it in about six to eight weeks, depending on the variety okay, of plants. It occupies a little space, as you can see. You can grow a lot. So, here we're on the mesa where land, you know, if we had to grow a million corn plants, that would be <laughs> prohibitively expensive. And so we have very, we can grow millions of plants in a very small space. We don't have to go out and cross the plant to, to make it 
so fertile. Many plants you need, they're, they're incompatible. That is, you can't get a seed if you have the male and the female gametes from the same plant. It's, it's the many incompatible cases, so you'd have to cross them. But this plant is so fertile, so you can just let it go. It produces progeny. It produces a large number of plants, 10,000 seeds, as many as 10,000 seeds per plant. It has a large collection, and I'll mention this, of naturally occurring varieties that we've ecologists and population biologists have collected across, across the globe. So it grows in a lot of different environments. And so if we can understand how the plant adapts itself to those different environments, then we can understand the genes that are needed to do that. And we can then presumably engineer those traits into other, other plants. And I'll talk about that. One important feature of all of these model organisms is that you can, you can genetically transform them. It means that you can get DNA into the plant. So if you want to confirm that you have a mutation, that you've identified the gene that encodes that mutation, what you do is something called complementation, where you take the gene that's normal and you put it back into the mutant and it restores the normal traits in that plant, and that's called transformation. And so you can do that very easily in a Arabidopsis. You can essentially take the plant and dip it in bacteria that contains the, the DNA that you want to get in, and the bacteria naturally transforms it into the plant. I'll mention that. So there's natural genetic engineering that happens every day in the wild. We just use that same tool. Um, it's got two chromosomes uh, for, for, for each chromosome. It's got a pair of chromosomes, so it does diploid genetics. I won't go into the details of why that's important. And I already mentioned the small genome. So here's what the size is. This is a corn seed. This is a Arabidopsis seed. So it gives you an idea of what the scale is here. So if I had a tube of Arabidopsis seeds, you know, a little microfuge two of a Arabidopsis seed, that would be, you know, 10,000 seeds or so. You can grow it here in your, in, in your classroom in a Petri dish. There's 10,000, actually this is probably more like 5,000 seeds in this, in, on this Petri dish. So they'll always just germinate them on agar. And what can you do with this? Well, this cluster over here is a cluster of plants that if you zoom in, they look like this. Why does this plant look different? It's got a mutation that creates a insensitivity to a hormone that we've studied for many years called ethylene gas, which is the fruit ripening hormone. So this, these plants all smell ethylene. They have receptors for ethylene. This one is mutated. You can't smell ethylene. So in a very simple experiment, this is like high tech, right? This is what we did when we started my lab. We started mutating this plant, screening for plants that were tall like this. And that gave us essentially all of the genes that we that are involved in fruit ripening pathway, although there's no fruit to ripen on this plant. Okay? Essentially, every plant that has a fruit that ripens has the same genes that we study in Arabidopsis. So we call this strains collected from around the world ecotypes or accessions. So they have adapted to locations, mostly in the northern hemisphere, but as far as the, off of the coast of Africa, Cape Verde Islands, um, you can find Arabidopsis that's been migrated by sticking to sailor's shoes, whatever, down into the coast, the tip of, of South Africa. And so these different plants have different traits. So they're all Arabidopsis thaliana. They all have a very similar genome, not identical. Okay? The, the, these genetic variants are what allows the plant to adapt to different cold, drought, salt tolerance, etc. So if we can understand that plant, we can understand the diversity of phenotypes that allows plants to adapt to these different environments. So as Ellen said, our group and a bunch of others, actually, we, we parse this out, as you'll see, divide by chromosome, completed the sequence of the first plant genome. And I hate to say how long ago that I was. Know, it feels like it. yesterday, <laughs> OK? But students in my laboratory don't know what it is to work um, without a genome sequence, where they're studying the genes. They're like, what? That was like ancient times. <laughs> and so that, but this was a challenge. This, uh, I'll talk about this a bit. There's five pairs of chromosomes. So these are the, this is kind of how we parsed it out. It was an international project. It was called the International Arabidopsis Genome Initiative. Our group and a group, another group, sequenced the largest chromosome. That was a big mistake. We took the largest chromosome. We got the most money, but we got, because every base was like a $1 to sequence the base at the time. The whole project cost $70 million. OK, I'll talk about that. Um, here's the actual number of bases. The number of genes predicted is actually, the number of real genes that are in there has grown now to 31,000. And it's more than exists in your genome. There are more, so, the, the, so the complexity of the organism doesn't scale with the number of genes. 
There are other processes like how genes are put together and spliced together, which make human much more complicated than a Rapidopsis. But the absolute number of genes is higher in this plant than in your, in your DNA. Um, I'll skip a lot of this. These are kind of the details um, about the genome. So here's a scale. The Rapidopsis genome, this is the genome size. Here's the Rapidopsis. The rice genome is a bit bigger. The corn genome is the same size as the mouse genome. I was trying to sort of look in the box. So this is about the same size as the human genome. But then you have plants like wheat that have you know, very large genomes, genomes you know, 20 times the size of the human genome. And so again, the complexity doesn't scale with the amount of DNA that's in the plant, right? There are many more genes here, but it, uh, the organism is not any, really any more complex than a Rapidopsis. Uh, so then you say, okay, now I have this genome sequence and we've predicted what the genes are. The prediction of the genes mostly comes from what's known already. So from other organisms that have been studied like yeast or Drosophila or C. elegans or uh, bacteria, by matching the sequence of the Arabidopsis gene to those other genes, you can predict maybe what the function is by taking the DNA sequence or protein sequence, putting it in, blasting it in a database to a huge database, which I'll talk about, and saying, well, what does this look like? Somebody else has done the hard work to show that that particular gene might be involved in growth and cell division. These are only hypotheses about, you know, they're, they're very likely to be true, but as Joe might tell you, the proteins have different functions, and so you could easily be fooled by this simple homology search. And many of the genes in the genome, even to this day, are unclassified. We have no idea what they do. Okay, so, so this is one of the challenges that I'll talk about. So this challenge is an international one. So there's an international project, called basically multi-coordinated, a multinational coordinated Arabidopsis genome project, essentially where I think 60 plus countries are involved with trying to understand the function of every gene in this reference species at the cellular, organismal, and even evolutionary context now. We have new tools to be able to do this. So, so there's lots of challenges here. Um, we want to expand this sort of genetic toolkit to be able to understand um, the, the functions of genes, and I'll talk about that. Um, um, there's a lot of kind of complexity to these plant genomes, much more complex than other genomes in terms of the numbers of copies of genes. So if you have two genes and they're doing the same thing and you knock one out by mutation, the other one still functions, you can't tell what the function of the one is that you've knocked out because there's a, there's a buddy there to complement that. And so you have to do multiple kinds of rounds of mutation and gene crossing, et cetera. And this puts a lot of uh, sort of challenges in the community. Also, there's a lot of, you need information scientists, basically bioinformaticists, when half of my lab basically don't actually do experiments anymore where they're, you know, sort of pipetting things and doing things. They actually just sit at the computer all day. I can't analyze data, the sort of a linchpin of the laboratory. And then we want to promote education. We want other people, because this is gonna have to be a multi-generational task. We're not gonna figure all, all this out before I retire, I'm sure about that, okay? And it's an international project, which is really good. Science, international science, really, really cooperation is important here. So yeah, it would involve 64 countries. Um, and often these labs, and you'll hear our labs here at Salk mostly work on Arabidopsis, but we've migrated to other plants to try to use this knowledge and gain new knowledge by working on plants that have some importance in the world. And Joe, will, Joe and Wolfgang will both talk about those things. Um, okay, so I just wanted to give a couple of ideas of, of sort of what you have. Now you have this information about the A's, T's, C's, and G's, and I'll tell you a little bit about how you get that. But the first thing you wanna do is figure out where are the genes, right? Spent $70 million, and I, we, when we talked about this in Washington at the press conference, you know, I was very tempted to say, <laughs> but I did tell the director of the National Science Foundation, hey, we've, we've sequenced the genome, but we know where the genes are, okay? You paid $70 million, we, gotta, we can only predict where the genes are. So we have to now develop new technologies to figure out where are the genes in the genome, because we, those genes are carrying out the functions of plant growth and development. And then some of the ways that we're gonna be able to test the functions. So here, identify the genes, test the functions of the genes. And so that's what we've been working on. So one of the things that we did, and this is now over a decade ago, 
is to take that genome sequence where we've got this 125 million A's, T's, C's, and G's and take that and design what's called a gene chip. So this is a Arabidopsis gene chip. It has the entire Arabidopsis genome sequence, essentially all the nucleotides printed sort of by a photolithography method, just like uh, you get chips in your cell phone by photolithography, that, but printing out the DNA sequences for every one of the bases. And then what you can do is take, grind up the tissue here, okay, extract the RNA, which is the expressed portion of the genes, label that up and then squirt it into this and it will hybridize to its corresponding spot in the genome and it'll light it up. Okay, so this is super old technology. Nobody uses this anymore, okay? But it was, it was bleeding edge, okay? Many people got cut when they, basically on trying to get this to work, but we did get it to work, and we actually, it was, it was pretty cool. I think, I don't, oh, I don't have any slides. So, uh, of that. But essentially, these gene chips allowed us to help find out where the genes are in the genome by this kind of assay. So this kind of leads me to this idea that you need new technology to understand biology. So it's a better microscope, right? You can see more, or it's a better DNA sequencing machine. And then that allows you to do new biology. And then you hit another roadblock. Hey, I can't figure out how to do it. I need a better electron microscope or something, okay? And then that allows you to learn new biology. Okay, so. Why do we need this technology? Because we got to figure out what the genes do before we can understand their, you know, how the plant grows. So the idea is to gain as much knowledge about every gene in the genome and what it's actually doing, not only you know, from the time it's a seed, but as it's growing, what is happening to the genes that are expressed in the plant throughout development. So one of the ways you do this, and this is sort of starting back from studies of E. coli decades and decades ago, is to make mutations. So how do you do that in, in a plant like a Arabidopsis? Well, I already mentioned that. You use this bacteria called Agrobacteria tumefaciens. And the reason it's called tumefaciens, that sort of stands for tumor. And so if you've ever seen these trees with the giant galls, you know, growing out looks like a tumor, that's caused by Agrobacterium. Agrobacterium is a natural genetic engineer. It has a genome and it has a chromosome that outside of its genome that is called a plasmid, a TI plasmid, so TI for tumor inducing. And that tumor inducing plasmid, uh, actually what it does, it, it contains, this is a prokaryotic organism, but in this piece of DNA, there are genes that can function in a eukaryotic organism. They can function in the plant genome. So what the bacteria does is it essentially mates with the plant cell creates a little channel, pushes part of its DNA out of its cell into the plant cell, and it integrates it into the plant chromosome. And then it's, these genes are expressed, and the bacteria has figured out how to make the plant cells grow by artificially creating genes that have hormones that the plant responds to. So these are normal plant hormones, auxin and cytokinin, two hormones that make plant cells grow and divide. Bacteria has figured out that those genes, if it puts it in there, make the plant cells grow. And then they have a whole bunch of other genes on there that they make amino acids that only the bacteria can eat. They're not natural amino acids that get incorporated into proteins. So it essentially turns it into a carbon and nitrogen producing factory. Okay? And so what you can do is get rid of all the bad stuff that creates the tumor, et cetera, and put what you want in there. Okay? Or you can just use this integration method where it just goes into the genome randomly to, when it goes in it, it'll disrupt the function of a plant gene. So you can just do that over and over again. You can take the, this plant, dip it in the bacteria, the seed then gets infected. You can plant those seeds in mass and then collect all the seeds. You, you can barcode all the plants, <laughs> extract the DNA and sequence the position of exactly. So here's the bacterial DNA, here's the chromosome of the plant in orange here, and this junction here, if we can capture that, we can tell exactly where it went, because we know the sequence now of the genome. So the advantage of having the sequence of the genome is when this thing jumps in and it lands there, when we sequence that junction, we know exactly where it is, what gene's been disrupted. And then, okay, so this is just that procedure. Take the, take the seed, treat it with agrobacterium, collect the plants. We can put genes in that allow us to, not every seed is transformed. We can identify the ones that are, collect them, put them in 
tubes, barcoded tubes, and then we can begin to screen them for phenotypes. That is, look for differences. If, a, if this one particular gene is mutated, is there an effect when you do that? And we can make, essentially, this is a whole collection. It's called the SALK tDNA collection. And there are several different kinds of collections that have been produced over the years. Our lab and a couple of other labs have done this. And this is the chromosomes, and this is where those tDNAs have landed. Actually, it's way beyond, this was published in 2003. We're way beyond this now. We have many more insertions. And you can go to our website, SignalSalk.edu. You can click on this Signal tDNA Express, and what you'll see when you open that page up are all of the, here's a part of a chromosome, chromosome one, the first 5,000 bases, here's all the genes that are going which, this direction or that direction, Watson strand or Crick strand. Um, and all of these little tick marks here are where those agrobacterium tDNAs have landed. So we have now a collection of plants where we have seeds um, let me see if I have a slide in it. No, I don't think I have a slide in it. So, so, where you can go and onto this website, and you can click any one of these. It'll open up another web page where you can order this seed from a stock center, not us. We have all these in our, st our stock room. I'll I can show you. We can sh I don't know if you're going to have a tour, but you can see it. Uh, and the, you can, for $4, get a mutation, a, a, a packet of seeds that has a mutation in it for any particular gene you want for about 95% of all the genes in the genome. And so you can actually order a collection from the same stock center. It's called the Rapidopsis Research Center at Ohio State University, ABRC. And they have collections that have all different interesting traits. I don't know if you guys have seen those or not, but I have some pictures of when you knock out genes, sometimes you'll see beautiful changes in the flowers and things like that. I'll show you a few examples. See, the idea is, is that we want to now, and we, we meaning the entirety of the 10,000 laboratories that study Arabidopsis around the world, essentially that many labs that in plant biology, you know, not exclusively working on Arabidopsis, but they use it. And so they're looking at all of these different metabolic pathways or how cells divide or, you know, how um, organelles form, things like that, chloroplasts, et cetera, they're using all of these collections. Oh, so here's our seed room. This is just a corner of it. So every one of these boxes has barcoded tubes, each one of which contains one of these insertion lines that we've mapped in the genome. Um, and so one of the things that's allowed us to do this is, again, another technology that we didn't develop, but others have developed for sequencing DNA. This is like the most advanced technology you can imagine, even more advanced than your cell phone, okay? The, the rate at which the transistors that are put, being put on the chip of your cell phone is here, it's called Moore's Law. But actually, the amount of DNA you can sequence for the cost is even growing faster than Moore's Law, right? You can see here that the, this is. And this is due to improvements in technology, and what we're looking at here is the cost per million bases, okay? So for Rabidopsis, it's 125 million bases. And this was, so it would be 125, so this would be, have been the cost in 2001 to sequence about, uh, so $5,000 would be give you five megabases of, of sequence. So now, I'll just show you how things change with time. So this is what I used to look like in <laughs> 1987, okay? And this was the entirety of all the sequences that were known, okay? This was the database. It was a series of volumes called GenBank, okay? <laughs> right here, okay? <laughs> that's the number of bases. You could put it in a book, okay? Here it is here. Wow, that's a huge number, right? Okay. And so, okay, and I'm again, hey, got a lot less hair, <laughs> bigger waist, okay? And that's how much sequence you could sequence in a day. Okay, so let's see, how much is this? So in, 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 this was 2013. This thing here is the Library of Congress, okay? And you could sequence 200 times the Library of Congress, okay, um, uh, in, in, with, with, with these kinds of sequencing machines, okay? Uh, and so this just gives you an idea. Oh, oh, uh, uh, so the, the entirety of the GenBank collection was 200 times the library of science. So it went from that seven-volume set to 200 times the, 
the, the amount of information in the Library of Congress. Now that's all of the sequencing happening around the world. Okay, this was the number of bases, all right, that, that were in this gen bank. Okay, so how has it changed since then? Okay, so this is modern day. I lost a little weight, okay. <laughs> okay, there's a negative correlation with sequencing now. You get se seven terabases of sequence can be produced by this instrument here in 40 hours, okay. That's, for this just one run on one sequencing machine, that's three quarters of all the information in the Library of Congress in 40 hours, okay. So now you can imagine there's a thousand of these machines out there in the world. That's a huge amount of data being produced for genome sequences right now. Okay, and I have it here is that they, what's going out this pipe here is dollars, okay, <laughs> right? Because what are these things? And the machine has two. You can load them in on the side here. This is $27,000, okay? So it's like a, it's like a, I was not saying Toyota, but I think the price is Toyota Corolla or something, maybe a, Toyota, maybe a Prius, I don't know. So you, this thing will run two of these, okay, and all the information that can be put here, the amount of DNA that can be sequenced on this is the Library of Congress on one, okay. So you can burn a lot of cash. So you need a lot of grant funds and you need a good reason to be doing this, right, because it's quite expensive. So this is just how it's changed over time. I just sort of, just to reiterate, it took 500 people, seven years, and $70 million to sequence that first genome. And then we've stepped through a whole bunch of technology. And now it's one person, one genome every 2.5 minutes, each for the price of a cup of Starbucks venti latte, okay? <laughs> so that's, that's, that's an improvement in technology that is unrivaled by any, by any system. So what is that? Why? What importance is that? Well, now we can go to that collection of 1400s. There's millions of accessions out there, but there have been 1400 that have been collected, sort of cataloged, what, where they're lo located, what their GPS information is, what kind of soil they're in, et cetera. We call this the 1001 Genomes Project because the human project had a thousand, was called the 1000 Genomes. We had to do 1001. <laughs> Okay, so just to beat our colleagues, okay. But essentially they have properties that you can now, this is, you can, we have these in our laboratory, we have them in the stock center. Anybody can order them. We've sequenced the genomes of all of them, okay. We know the genetic variation between them. And now any laboratory can carry out experiments and try and identify what are the genes that are the characteristics that allow those plants to grow in that environment. So we can move from technology to biology, right? So what is the biology that we're interested in studying, okay? How plants adapt to environments. But many of us here at Salk have been interested in hormones. My colleague, Joanne Corey, who's a, 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 a kind of a pioneer in Arabidopsis genetics and hormone biology studies hormones. I'll mention the one she studies. My lab studied this simple gas, ethylene. And not, these are tomato fruits, but this, this plant that's insensitive to ethylene here is equivalent to this tomato, which has never seen ethylene. So what ripens the fruit is ethylene. You can make a mutation in Arabidopsis that doesn't respond, so this is what the ripened Arabidopsis looks like in the ripened fruit. This is the unripened. And the genes that control this process are exactly the same, okay? It would take, it would have taken forever because of the, comp the you know how long it takes to grow your tomatoes, et cetera, they get, you know, they, it, 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 it's, it's maybe one season a year. And so identifying the genes in tomato was, was tough. And so, but it can serve. So what ethylene is involved in many different ripening processes in, in all, all sorts of fruits, apples, lemons, et cetera. And this is a, a picture from my, out of the back of near my house, which was over those trees when I lived in New Jersey, okay? And this, the farmer was spraying something, thinking, oh, this is really going to be nasty. It's going to blow right into our house. What, it, what the farmer was actually doing was he was spraying something on the part of the field to ripen the fruit. So because migrants will come and pick the fruit, he would be spraying was a compound that basically releases ethylene gas. And so it's called ethophon. Ethophon, you spray it. So then, because you'll know tomatoes ripen at different rates, but you can spray them in the field and get them to ripen more uniformly. Then you can go through and pick this part of the field, and this part of the field is still green. So that's sort of ethylene in, the, in, in, in agriculture. Here's another example of what ethylene does. And so, uh, so why your, you know, your, your Valentine's flowers fade is because ethylene, they're ethylene responsive. And sometimes you'll see they may spray them with something before they 
you know, in the floral shop, they'll spray the cut flowers with something. That something is an inhibitor of the receptors of ethylene, okay? Where, so these guys were ethylene insensitive. They either be sprayed with this inhibitor or they're genetically modified, which is what we did here. So they just can't smell the ethylene anymore and so they, the flowers stay, right? So it's a natural part of the senescence program in a plant where it'll, after three days, the, in this case, these petunias, will, the petals will enroll and they're gone by 13 days, whereas if you make genetic variants that affect the process, it, they don't. Also things like the shedding of, of, of leaves, of organs, is also controlled by ethylene. So one of the postdocs, former postdoc in my lab, Sarah, Sarah Lilligren, was, has been studying this pathway. She now has her own laboratory. Um, and you can make mutations where, you know, what there's leaves and, 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 and petals and, and, and sepals and, and around the flower in Rapidopsis. And normally those would upsize when you get the fruit. This is now the fruit here and it's something called the salique. And all of these parts normally fall off. And if you make mutations that affect this process, never shed, they don't, even after the fruit has matured, they just stay on there because there's nothing to, to upsize them. That is, there's a cell layer here that responds to ethylene and it just basically, it's like a razor blade. It just it upsizes, it cuts it off. And so there's lots of processes controlled by these hormones. And so can we use this information? This is all abscission here. These, all of these things were, have to fall off. So the apple falls from the tree, cotton balls have to be harvested, leaves fall from the tree. This is tumbleweed, it upsizes. That's all process that's controlled in many cases by ethylene. So the impact of studying a plant like Arapidopsis can have commercial applications. So here's some of these other interesting looking plants. So this is what the normal Arapidopsis flower looks like for for petals, uh, but you can get mutations that will transform the petals into leaves. You see here, you could get these from the stock center if you, if you want to order these. There's actually a multi-mutant where several genes that are involved in this normal process will convert the leaves. You can see here they're green and they have these little hairs on them like leaves, these are tri trichomes. Or you can get flower into flower, these double flowers, and that's a, iteration of the meristem. The meristem keeps making petals. It doesn't terminate. And um, this is all, much of this work is from Elliot Meyerowitz's lab, who's at Caltech, who's, who pioneered the studies of, of, of flower development at Rapidopsis. And then one of our former colleagues, Detlef Weigel, who's now in Germany, Detlef identified genes that when you put them from a Rapidopsis into a a plant like aspen, which takes forever to flower, you can actually get the aspen to flower, and that what we're looking at here is it's flowering at a very juvenile stage because it's expressing a gene from Arabidopsis that makes it flower. So now if you want to breed aspen trees, you don't have to wait 20 years for the tree to start flowering. You can actually get it to flower in a little pot and you can start to do genetic crosses. So it's these kinds of genes are enabling traits. Even even for biology, so my laboratory works on Arapidopsis, and now we work also on the brain. <laughs> the way we got into that was very complicated, but essentially it's because uh, we identified some interesting regulatory pathways that, that function in plants that actually have functions in, in medicine and in the brain. And so it can even lead you to these other studies. So these are genetically identical except for one gene which, which affects the plant, and it happens to be a copper transporter which is involved in putting copper into proteins, that's a gene called Mikan's disease gene in people. And so um, as this is a, a, some work from our, our colleague here, Joanne Corey, who heads the Plant Biology Laboratory. And Joanne, over the decades, has been studying steroid hormones. And she identified essentially almost all of the components in how a plant responds to hormones, the steroid hormone, the same kind of steroid hormone pathway that you have in people. And you, what you can see here is there's a huge difference. In, so this is a normal Arabidopsis. This is one that's defective in the ability to make the hormone, and this is one that's responding to the hormone can sort of constitutively, and so it makes a, makes a much bigger plant. So you control plant size and plant growth. And then this is something you may recognize, right? So this cauliflower, this is a, from work from our colleague Marty Yanofsky across the road at UCSD. Marty's lab has been studying flower development, and so what Marty figured out were the genes that actually created the cauliflower. So nobody really knew what the mutations were that created a cauliflower. But you can see as Marty's turned the Arabidopsis plant here into a cauliflower, <laughs> okay? And so there's a couple of genes called call, call genes 
that he uh, was able to identify that there's actually two. You make a double mutant, and you can turn a Rabinopsis into a Kalfa. So essentially, you can make new crops with this. You could, you could create any plant, and if you taste it okay. Essentially, this is just many inflorescence meristems. It's just iterating the inflorescence meristem. I mean, you could turn any plant into something that's like a cauliflower if you wanted to eat it using that same technology. So other applications are like this. So this, um, the same postdoc that in my lab worked on never shed is a graduate student. She worked on Marty Nazi's lab. And she identified the genes that were involved in splitting open. You know, you have the seed pod. It has to split open for the seeds to fall out on the ground so you can get germination. But farmers don't want that. The farmers don't want the seeds to fall out on the ground. Okay, this, net, it's the, the, this is canola. Okay, and so about 10 to 20 percent of the canola crop falls on the ground, the, but the farmers want to harvest it. So if you can understand how to control that abscission in this in the seed pod here, you can you can say this. So that's actually what's happening, um, and now that technology that to prevent the seed from shattering, and the genes are called shatterproof. Okay, um, are this is you know the massive seed collection that you have for things like canola. It's a huge industry for canola oil or soybean. Oh, this is soybean. In this case, the, the previous slide was, was canola. And that's the same genes that you have in Arabidopsis that control the shattering of Arabidopsis. So how can you do this? I don't want to go into the details of, of, of this. One way was to mutate the genes with tDNA, but that's random. That, that, that you need to have a collection like we have in Arabidopsis, and nobody has that for any other plant. It's just too hard. Rice, they have some. So the way you can do that now is something you've probably heard of. You're watching television. Somebody starts talking about CRISPR-Cas9. It's like, what the heck is that? So that, or in the horror movie or something, somebody's going to CRISPR your genome. Uh, so I don't want to get into the details of this, but essentially it's, it's taking and harnessing what bacteria do to protect themselves from viruses. So like, you can have a 100,000 gallon vat of yogurt, okay, which is essentially all bacteria. And if it gets infected with a particular phage, it wipes out the whole bat. So the guys that were studying that at Dannon identified and were able to manipulate the bacteria so that they could recognize the phage and prevent the 100,000 gallons of yogurt from going bad by kill, being killed by phage. That system can be moved out of the bacteria into any, any cell, into a mammalian cells, and it works. So it's only a very simple system. Essentially, here's your DNA here. And then what this, what this bacteria has are two components, basically. It has, a, it has an RNA, okay, this is called tras, tracer RNA. Okay, and what you can do is you can make a piece of RNA that can fool the bacteria. It's not a bacterial gene, not a phage gene. It's any gene in the human genome or any gene in the plant genome you want. You can put where all these ends are. You can put your favorite gene. It could be the gene for the shatterproof. You can put 20-some bases of that. And then what this, what this protein will do called Cas9 is it will pair the RNA that you put into the cell with the right spot in the genome, exactly the right spot by base complementation here, where the RNA matches exactly in the genome. It's like a precision surgical thing. It's drawn here with scissors. And that enzyme will then cut exactly at that position and nowhere else. So you can create mutations now in any gene that you want. And this just goes over that whole process here, how you would do that in a plant. Okay. So, some of you are probably saying, ah, oh, geez, it's, it came from a grocery store, right? But here, so what I'm showing you on this slide is sort of surgical precision, okay, where only that region is cut, okay? These two plants, so these four plants here, are, were all derived from the same mother plant. They are more different from one another, whoops, than the plant that would be edited here. It would only be edited at this one position. But these plants, just by the process of just cell division, have about 100 different mutations in them, even though they're supposed to be genetically identical. Because the polymerase makes errors. It makes more errors than this system here. So this is surgical precision to modify one gene. There are more mutations in these plants than in the one that, we, that you can create there. So, I'm not so worried about the horror part here because it's happening in these plants all the time and it's actually much more 
uncontrolled way. So I rather like this, okay, slide. This is the challenge, okay? You don't want to eat this, okay? And so this is a drought-resistant corn, and this guy is saying, don't eat it, right? The guy who's got a whole different agenda. Okay, so essentially what we want to do is use that plant Arabidopsis to identify how a plant grows from seed to seed, all the genes, all the cells, et cetera, so that that information can be used to speed up, modify plants' response to the environment. Joe will tell you about what's happening with the environment. And so, yeah, if you want to eat, okay, then you'll be pro-improving the crops, right, because we're going to have challenges for, for the future. So I'll stop there. I'm happy to take questions. Don't be shy. Don't I won't bite. Go ahead. I know you tell this to your students. <laughs> Please ask questions. Well, so my question yeah. just for the teachers. So they could contact you and get um, seeds. Absolutely. That, um, Whatever. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a better set. If, if you have any, if you click on one of those and you want one, yes, we can give it to you. But there's a, a sort of a teaching set at the ABRC, which they will give you for free. I don't even think they charge the $4, but the, it's $4 a pack. But I think they'll, they, that's part of their mission is to have outreach. So I, we can get the link to you. But they have a whole different set of, you know, what, whatever you're interested in, in kind of doing an experiment with these mutants. Rapid ops, yeah, ABRC. If you search ABRC we'll in Ohio, yeah. We'll that link and then click on education, and it'll show you all the, all the seed collections that they have if you want to order them, just to grow them and see what they look like. Yeah. Of every, like, experiment you've done, kind of what's your absolute favorite? Hmm. My favorite one is that Petri dish. My favorite one is that Petri dish because from that experiment, we spent 20 years understanding many different genes came out of that screen. And we actually did the opposite. We looked for plants that showed the response that never saw ethylene. They activated the pathway without. So we could get genes that were inactive, active, et cetera. And we spent 20 years studying all those genes. And, and, uh, and all of them exist in every other plant. That was my favorite experiment. Yeah. So what's the parameters for growing it on that agar? Like, does it work with an agar? Is it nutrient-based? Yeah, there's nutrients. So you could use water agar. It'll grow for a little while in water agar, you know, until it runs out of nutrients. But we, you can put some, 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 some sucrose in there uh, and some fairly cheap salts that you, that you can make up. You can make up a couple, you know, a carboy of them and use it for a long time. So it's called Meshuggah Scoob Medium, like half X. It's very easy to make. There are some, yes, there are some. If you want to do that experiment, there's some. I'm, I'm wondering, I'm, they may have some of those at the stock center I can, uh, I can find out. But yeah, so you could grow them at some two different temperatures. Yes, exactly. Yeah, there's some plants that think they're in the light that are not in the light. There are ones that think they're seeing ethylene that are not seeing ethylene. So you can find big differences. The ones with the flowers are really cool kids like those. Yeah. 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 So we, we have actually we had a paper last year describing some new genes that are involved in the um, drought response. Uh, ABA. There's a lot of, of interest in that, obviously. Mm -hmm. The gene transcription factors that regulate sets of genes that are involved in drought resistance, salt resistance. And there's a lot of overlap, it turns out, because essentially the salt can be changing the, the osmotic mm -hmm. pressure in the cells, and, and the same thing with drought. And so you, there's a lot of overlap in those pathways. But yeah, there, those, are, those can be applied. In fact, we apply for a patent that, you know, that on using those genes to, to improve drought and salt resistance. But they're naturally occurring. You can't patent a gene anymore. You can't patent genes. You can only patent a process for using that information to, to, um, 
to uh, improve the crop, but not the genes themselves. It's so important that you get that kind of information out with the um, specific canola bean seeds yeah. and canola seeds that yeah. they don't drop back. Because students come to class now with products that are printed on the side containing no GMO. Yeah. So there's this, there's this very quiet message that GMOs are bad and GMOs are bad. Well, bad. yeah. If we can get that information into our hands, yeah. Yeah. Seeds and the soybean seeds and the uh, drought resistance that the GMO isn't always about glyphosate and right. Monsanto. Well, yeah, I think I might have had it. I don't know if I put it in here or not. I had a slide that I was going to show you some maybe cool thing, and I don't know if I took it out or not at the end. No, took it out. I. I so one example that is a recent example, if you look in the New York Times, is taking a crop that's an orphan crop. This is off of what you said. but um, So it's a tomato that is very super sweet that no one could eat because it didn't have the properties that would allow the farmers to grow it. And they just edited a few genes, and it's going to be a new crop. You'll be eating these like super sweet tomato relatives. Um, and... You know, there's no downside to that. You could have done it through 30 years of breeding, but, you know, it's not Roundup resistant. It's just changed the architecture of the plant in a way that allows the farmer to grow it and harvest it. So new crops can be made. It doesn't have anything to do with pesticides or herbicides. And it could have been done after 30 years of breeding to breed, <laughs> to breed that plant to get the branching you want. But if you change three or four genes, it'll actually grow up taller instead of a ground berry, which is called... It'll grow up taller and it have more fruits and you can just harvest it. There's no thing other than changing the architecture of the plant. But yeah, I mean, there's this essentially 95% probably of all the soybeans and corn that we eat is, is genetically modified. And the benefit, let's just give an example for corn. The benefit of that is, is that those corn plants which are um, resistant to an uh, insect that when it chews it, it eats the leaves, eventually, if you have a corn borer bores a hole in the stalk and then you have fungus that grow in there, you have aflatoxin, the levels of aflatoxin. So this has nothing to do with the, 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 um, the fruit that you eat, but the, the protein, the cry protein that's expressed prevents the, 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 the corn borer from boring into the corn. And so there's a lot less toxic byproducts from harvesting the corn just as a side side benefit that nobody even expected. So, yeah, it's, it's challenging because, um, you know, there's a lack of information. Like I said, the example is <laughs> that these plants, all from the mother plant, have more genetic variation than what you can create, in, you know, by changing one gene. And that's the absolute truth. Whether you're scared about that or worried about that is, is, a lot, is a, to me, it's just an education thing. Because there's more genetic variation in the environment than you could ever create by using these technologies.